Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing the philosophy of suicide. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Wexford, an Irish style cream ale from the Wexford Brewery in <laughs> Suffolk, England. Uh, oh, that's going to be a good sound right there, isn't it? Yeah. It says it's got a draft flow system. Uh, this can contains mm. a pressurized widget. Do not tamper even when empty. Okay, whatever that means. Holy oh, moly. Oh, wow. Look at the look on that. I'm excited. It looks good. It's almost like a nitro. Like you could pour it hard. Yeah. Like it's... it's I am real excited about this one. So, what are we doing today, John? We are talking about suicide, and I want to make a little bit of a disclaimer beforehand. Uh, you know, this is going to be... A little PSA. Yeah. This is going to be one of our more sensitive topics, hopefully, that we do for the season. Uh, I know it's we've gotten the season off to a rather dark start. Um, if you found this podcast, you found this video, uh, because you're contemplating suicide or thinking about it um i, I want to kind of warn against using this as a as a guide for you um for a couple reasons uh, one as we'll discuss later in this episode individual circumstances of your situation are really important to any kind of life decisions you make um and being able to talk to somebody in a very stressful situation is important so uh want to give a plug first to the national suicide prevention lifeline uh, the phone number is 1-800-273-8255. I'll put that on screen for anyone watching. And just encourage anyone to talk to somebody. Maybe that hotline isn't for you, but talk to friends, yeah. talk to family, talk to a professional. Talk find, to somebody. Find help. Find yeah. help. We all need it sometimes. So that said, uh, let's dive in. I, I also want to say before we get started, uh, for this show, I'm going to be leaning heavily on some courses put out by P Professor Kagan from Yale University. He's on uh, Yale Courses and has put out a three-part course, which is a really well done course. Yeah, on, on s the philosophy of suicide. And unfortunately, we won't be able to cover everything he does because he has three hours and we have about one. Um, but if you want to check out a more in-depth look at, at all this, uh, I would recommend you go check out uh, those videos, part one, two, and three. Um, when talking about suicide, uh, mortality in general is, is one of those things that we generally don't like to think about. We don't like to talk about. We, we like to make everyday assumptions that we're going to live forever. That, you know, whenever you, you start discussing it is, is obviously not the case, or, or at least very low probability. But we don't act in such a way most of the time, mm -hmm. like, like we're uh, going to die. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly don't act like we're going to self-inflict death. And so when we're, we're, when we're talking about this subject, uh, there's a couple different aspects that I've, I've broken this up into. Um, the first three come in directly, you know, from the three videos. Uh, the rationality of suicide. Can we have a rationally argued suicide? Now, this doesn't get into morality. That's going to be a later segment. But just can it be rational to kill yourself? Yeah, yeah. Uh, next is, is uncertainty and logic. And, and when we get into that section, we're going to talk about some of the stresses of suicide, how anyone in a suicidal situation it must be under a great deal of stress. So could you be rational in that situation? And could you make a rational decision? If you could, could that rational decision be suicide? So that's going to be part two. Part three, we're going to go into the moral questions of it. Uh, which which is uh, distinguished from uh, rationality. And the, the fourth section uh, is one that actually doesn't get uh, talked about in the courses, but I think we can we can talk about it a little bit. Is religion and how religion yeah. kind of affects some of these questions. Uh, we're going to be touching on that a little bit in the previous ones, but we're going to try and for the most part assume a very uh, secularist view of death through that until we get to religion because that raises different questions yeah, yeah. um so on the the very first state of rationality there's been some actually interesting work done on suicide and rationality 
And one of the, the very early critiques you run across when you start talking about uh, suicide is the two-state requirement of, of suicide. So when you talk about is suicide a good idea, you, you have to make a value judgment on that, right? And a value judgment generally requires that you look at two states. For instance, you could be talking about wallpaper in your house, right? And you say, would it be better to wallpaper this house in flowers, right? Well, to make that judgment, we have to look at what the wall looks like now. And then what would the wall look like with flowers all over it? And then look at those two states and make a comparative contrast of those two states. Cool. The two state uh, requirement violation that, that's accused is that when you die, it's nothingness. There is no state there. So the two state requirement is violated. There isn't a state afterward in, for you to, to have... So if there's no state, you couldn't say it's better to commit suicide because there is no better to be. It's it, it's in violation of this. What do, what do you think about a two-state requirement on being better and, and the idea that this logically couldn't be better because there's not a second state there? Yeah, I, I think it. I, I think that's a, a, a – if you're looking at from an individual perspective, I think it makes sense. I, mm -hmm. I You know, it's it, – uh, bad is better than nothingness. If you look at something, you know it's uh, uh, there, there, there's a difference there. You've got something and you've got nothing. Uh, my question is, are, do you look at that from a from, from an individual perspective, or do you look at that from the effect on others' perspective? And that's something a little different there when you, when you look at that. Yeah, and, uh, and, and because it's not nothingness when you talk about about the effect on on others, the continuance of the universe yeah, past yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, and 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 we'll definitely uh, dive into that a lot more in morality. Yeah, uh, well, and I I think that this two state question presupposes that death does equal nothingness, and I don't think that that is something that we can with confidence say. Yeah, and that's not not even touching on what religion says about what happens after death, but just that we don't have the information. Um, we can say that most definitely the, the body continues to be, and there's something that is no longer contained within that body or is no longer active in that body. But I don't think that we can confidently say that it is in fact nothingness. So I think there is, they're supposing that there is not a state there, that existence does cease. And, and I think there is at least a possibility that, there, that you can say there may very well be a state over here. And I think the better question to ask here is actually um, known versus unknown. Yeah. Yeah, this definitely touches on the hard consciousness problem. What is consciousness? And, and even some of the more modern uh, uh, theories that have been put forward that everything has a level of consciousness. And then we have to ask, is there a consciousness after death? Even if it's not something religious that we always knew, but does a rock have a certain level of consciousness? Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to dive into that here, but I think we can agree consciousness changes at the very least when you die. Yeah, it, you it, know. to me, it it it... I hate to use the word soul here because it's it, it, it's got such religious connotation, but it, it to, to say say something versus nothingness has to presuppose that there's something beyond the physical body that that, that makes life. Yeah, because the the physical body is still there. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not animated, but it's still there. Yeah, it, it's not nothing. Yeah, the only reason, way to call it nothing is to say that that spark of humanity is gone. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and even has to suppose that. What we are perceiving as existence is, in fact, real. Um, you could make the argument that we don't for sure know that we are existing now in a state. Um, if we are nothing but a figment of someone's imagination, um, do we really exist? Yeah. Actually, philosophy has a really in interesting... State. Yeah. Philosophy has a really interesting critique of this, which which most find this this view kind of appealing until the critique is put forward. And so so here's how the critique goes: if you if you 
talk about a two state value problem. You say you can't say it's better to commit suicide because there's not a second state. You also have to kind of accept the inverse of that. And that is to say, let's say a guy's walking across the street and you, you see a car coming and you go to save him and you tackle him and you're, you're both, you get up and you go, man, you, you almost died back there. Uh, uh, I'm glad I got to you in time. That was lucky. And, and he would have to look at you and say, no, 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 sir, you're philosophically confused. See, because to say it's better not to die supposes two states and, and there's not a second state there. So according to the two state problem, you can't say it's not better not to die because then you've supposed a second state. So we kind of get into this problem when you say, I can't put, I can't value assess death to say, well, you can't value assess not dying because there's a second state requirement to doing that. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of a riddle to, to deal with, uh, an enigma here. Yeah. 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 Life or death in in that evaluation um, is immeasurable, or rather, the advantage of life. Yes, They're incomparable. That's yeah. better. Yeah. So, so I think that the, this practically presents a problem because most people wouldn't say that. Most people wouldn't say if you went to the doctor and you were having a heart attack and he performed CPR, wouldn't say, uh, you know, why did you waste so much energy and and you didn't make me any better. You know, and, 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 and so we, we kind of get back into this problem of the value of suicide and, and whether it's ever appropriate. The second thing, and we're going to lean really hard on utilitarianism until the end of yeah. morality, because uh, uh, deontology gets into some really deep and interesting yeah. questions that we, we won't be able to, to – we're just going to scrape the surface of in this podcast. Uh, and, and that talks about the future value test. Now, uh, with the future value test, uh, b because we're not talking about it from a moral point of view, we're just asking the question, could it ever be logical? It's very uh, self-centered in, in its approach, um, though you, you could make some logical arguments for a more outward view of it. But even so, it doesn't change the fundamentals of the question. So we, we could look at, at a, uh, a question where uh, so we know somebody has – we have a magic – a crystal ball and we can see the future right and we know that uh, somebody's in a car accident and they're going to have a really really bad life it's it's not going to get better and they've had a really good life up till now their, their life has had a positive value and 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 everything from this point forward will be almost a negative on the total value of a life. And I think we have to be able to assess a positive and a negative on, on, on the value of a life because if we can't assess a good, there has to be an inverse, right? If it's, if it's good to be able to walk, it's bad not to be able to walk, right? And, and if we can look at a total... Unless you can do sick wheelchair tricks. Yeah, Sorry, go ahead. but couldn't you do that when you walked? Um, but if we can if we can assess a bad of life, right, a, 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 a point at which life will become negative, and I think we've all had personal experience with this, that, that grandfather who was in the hospital with terminal cancer and he was going to die in a month anyway and was suffering through the rest of this, um, then can we ask, could it, could it possibly be logical for someone to say, you know what, at this point in my life, things are, I'm going to die in a month anyway. Death is coming. Like that, that's that's not changed. But for that month, things will be really bad, and I would rather have my life have a higher net value by not spending this. We'll call it life capital on this really bad portion. Why not? You know, cut cut my uh, losses right now and, and be done with it. Can can we see a, a logical uh, 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 progression to this argument? So the the, the thought here is that that. If you can't perceive a better future than you have now, would it be better to stop life at this point? It's is not that even, what I'm getting at? Well, it's, it's not even completely that because you could imagine somebody whose life peaked out in high school and they still had a relatively good life afterwards, but it wasn't the peak of their life. We're talking about someone's life who who becomes overall negative. It yeah. becomes a very unbearable thing. So but, it crosses that positive negative yeah, line. But, but, but you're, still, you're still making that assumption – that there's not something better in the future, that there can't be something better. Right. Well, and in this and that's case, where the crystal ball we're assuming yeah, the yeah, crystal ball. Yeah, we're assuming yeah. that we know somehow, whatever yeah. that is. Does suicide in the case of knowing, and we can discuss what yeah, that is yeah. a little in the next section, make sense, kind of? Yeah. Well, and then I have to ask the question, 
what is, because the way that you framed this at least Mm -hmm. um, is on the idea of, okay, so I know that for this future period of time, for the rest of my life, um, if I continue with the rest of my life, um, the net value, and and we're doing this um, in the hedonistic tradition here of a good thing in your life has a positive value and a negative thing in your life has a negative value. Suffering versus, yeah. yeah. And um, and your life is evaluated at the end based on kind of what your what the sum total is of yeah, all of yeah. that together. But what is the value of having a once you're dead of having a positive life value over a negative life value? Well, and 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 I think that's an interesting question, but it it. it, it poses a, a greater problem to this whole question, mm-hmm. right? Because if we ask, can you even have a positive net value to life, we get kind of back into that that two-state model of, well, if we can't have a positive value and we can't have a negative value, then wouldn't you know a, a random coin flip every day be just as well a, a way of determining suicide? Like, I flipped a coin today, it was heads, I'm not going to do it, I'm not, oh, it's tails today. But it's no better to be dead or alive, so why not do it? And and I think that 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 view uh, is, it, it it doesn't seem natural. It doesn't seem mm-hmm. like a view that we we kind of accept. So I think it's problematic to our nature to, to kind of look at it in those terms. I think you have to say there can be a good life uh, uh, if we just consider our own nature. Well, and all I'm asking is where, where does the value come in that we say um, having a long life that ultimately maybe has a negative three value – is worse than having a shorter life that ultimately has a, neg- a positive two value well, and, and, or and, a zero value. And I think you get into the question of value systems, right? Because yeah. you talk about negative three. And, and that's actually where I'm interested. You, you talk about negative three and a long life and those. But I, I would imagine with a good value system, if longevity was a valuable thing to you, mm-hmm. you would calculate whether that longevity and then maybe that's not a negative mm-hmm. three, right? Um, so I would say that, that, that may be a factor that needs to be calculated into the bigger equation of value. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can talk about a, a, a long list of value equations and how those add up. But at the end of the day, you know, when you pick one, then a a number has to come out (laughs) like a a positive or negative number. And then from that, you know, you you can talk about total value. Mm -hmm. Maybe your life got worse, but your longevity weight in and of itself actually put you were negative one, but longevity weight has a two every year. And so it actually pushes you back up to a one, right? So that, that now you're in, in the good again. Yeah. So, so you're, you're reaching into the container theory there. Um, and this, I guess would be assuming the uh, modest value or the modest good. Well, but before we, we okay. start invoking those, I think we need to define them just a little bit. And, yeah. And this is a great segue into container theory. So container theory says that um, <coughs> there are three different valuations here, one of them being uh, the neutral container, the container being life, and everything that goes in the container being your experiences, uh, your experiences, your actions, all of that. The neutral container says that life is neither good nor bad. It is solely the experiences and actions in your life. Collection of your experiences. Yeah. 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 That contribute to the value of your life. The modest container theory says that there is some value to life inherently and that, um, that the inherent value of life coupled with the experiences and actions of your life, um, contribute to the overall. So, and, and that's where John's kind of thing of maybe the inherent value of your life gets a two value. If we're just kind of throwing numbers out there each year that you go on living and that can counteract some of the negatives in your life. Um, and then there is the fantastic value theory that no matter what else, no matter what goes into your box of experiences, life itself has a value so high that even a life that is explicitly bad experiences and and bad actions a life of torture yeah um is still 
a net positive. Yeah, well, and, and actually, I want to I want to take a step back before we go into that because actually, okay. uh, modest container theory and fantastic container theory are a subgroup of another group. The 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 three main groups are uh, good container theory, neutral container <sighs> theory, and then there's actually a, a whole set that we're not going to get into this uh, on this podcast because I think th they're kind of fringe beliefs, but a bad container theory, mm -hmm. a, a theory that. Life itself is a bad thing yeah. and, and either has a modest negative or a fantastic negative. Um, I, I would say evolutionarily, uh, par probably part of the reason that these, these views are not as, as prolific as, yeah. as good container theory is, well, those guys died, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, so, so, so speaking on the modest container theory, you, you've kind of touched on it now with the... There is some good to life, but it's not it's not an absolute. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and I think we kind of touched on neutral container theory earlier when we, when we talked about the raw future value mm -hmm. uh, uh, weight weight test. Um, but then there's this third one. There's this fantastic value container mm -hmm. theory, and a, this one gets into some oddities. This, this fantastic value container. <clears throat> it it says that life is so amazing that we should always there's nothing bad enough that can happen that we shouldn't want it being a a vegetable completely incapable of taking care of yourself on life support is better than death well and, and that's kind of an open question that's been posed to these people and and there's been various responses uh you start to talk about p-value uh, uh. well and, and i think in theory that applies i think practicality may say otherwise to the well, people who ascribe to well that. no no no. i wouldn't i wouldn't even say that there okay. are there are people who subscribe to the fantastical uh, container theory, but they, they consider someone in a vegetative state has lost their container, right? They don't consider the container the body. They consider container life, and and they've lost their life. They're, they're just, you know, you, you, you might even consider a That's more... That's dangerous. Yeah, well, you might consider a, a more extreme example where uh, Frankenstein's monster, but a, a slightly different variant on it, where Frankenstein's monsters has died and he's brought him back to life, but he's not this roaming beast as as he's portrayed in the story, but he's rather this 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 rotting corpse on life support, right? And then you would ask, is that really alive? I mean, a heart's beating, but is that a living thing? Mm -hmm. And and I think there there are varying views uh, within the fantastic container theory on that. Um, the, the the other thing that that we get into, and we talked about this a little bit last week, is centricism, right? If, if we're talking about a fantastic container theory of life, uh, does that mean that all, all life is... I mean, if you talk about comparing infinities, I mean, a blade of grass... It would be so fantastic to be a great a blade of grass because it, it's a living thing. And, and we have this fantastic... And okay. so now we that have... That is a big dead thing. Yeah, yeah. So now we have to ask this, this really interesting utilitarian question of is mowing your lawn... Uh, uh, mass, Genocide. yeah, mass slaughter of these fantastic value containers. It sounds like a very binary understanding of uh, of philosophy. Yeah, uh, it, you know, good or bad. Yeah, yeah. well, and and so when a lot of people talk about fantastic container theory, they say, well, no, we're we're more talking about sentient life. So they they kind of some of them kind of make that distinction on what it is. Uh, I think most people don't subscribe to the fantastic uh, value container. Although it's a lot more prolific than the than it's this opposite, it, it's detrimental. We'll call yeah. it container theory, where the container is terrible, right? Yeah. Well, and I, I think most people who would claim to uh, subscribe to the fantastic container theory would, with very little probing, be able to find a lot of holes in in just how fantastic that container is. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, they, I, 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 I'd want to. I'd want to look a little more. I, I suspect those that follow that that belief also are going to be the same group that we're going to talk about in part four with the religious section in, in, in a lot of ways. Now, I could be wrong. Possibly. There. And I uh, think there's definitely crossover I, I, there. I think there's. I don't think it's so much a a a a, a logical understanding as a philosophical understanding at that point. And um, you know, that's just kind of. It might be a little different there. Yeah. yeah, the 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 last one I want to talk about, and this one's kind of sitting on the edge between this uh, uncertainty logic problem and and rationality, but it's it's the gift of life argument. Now 
you could make this argument from a religious uh, standpoint, but you could also make it from a non-religious standpoint. The religion's not a necessity, though it's often a component of this argument. And the gift of life theory goes something like this. If, um, if, if I gave you a really nice set of china and then you took it and you broke it all, uh, that, that would be, you know, disrespectful to, to, to the gift. I didn't uh, like the china you gave me. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and it tastes terrible. And you would, you have some, some amount of, of, you owe something to a gift giver. Now that something may not be the, the monetary value, but it's an amount of, of respect yeah, that you, yeah. you owe to the gift you were given. And so, so the gift of life theory says, well, life is a gift we were given, no matter how or why we were given it. And to kill that is like breaking the China set um, in, in trying to... You know, it's it's disrespectful to the origin of life, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so so we owe some some debt to to that life of of preserving it. Yeah, again, again, I think a, a, a one that's going to cross over heavily into the religious aspects of things. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, uh, I don't I, think I, it has to. I don't it, think it has yeah, to. By any absolutely. Stretch. I think that 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 a pure Darwinist can be can be right there there as well. Yeah. But I think you're going to find that very heavy. Particularly in your Orthodox and your Catholic faiths and your, uh, you know, Jewish, yeah, uh, you know, it's going to be something a little different there. Before we get into a, a philosophical critique of of the um, uh, gift of life theory, do y'all have any any thoughts on on on? Do you buy into the gift of life theory? I mean, is this a compelling theory to you? Uh, it, it, it is to me. It, it's something that I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've dealt with this in, in my life a few times and. Uh, you know, to to me, there's there there is something, and and, and it's not a logical. It's it's mm -hmm. not something that I get, get I reach logically. It's something that I reach emotionally and spiritually, and something that's already inside me that I look around and I say, there's something so valuable here that's that's been given you, and and you're required to protect that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I I understand where it's coming from. Now I've gone in and out of it, mm -hmm. and I've got some different uh, different views on some things there, but. But I completely understand where it comes from, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think I would probably fall fall right in there. I understand the appeal of it, but I don't subscribe to it. Okay, the the, the philosophical critique to the gift of life uh, idea is is the bully's gift, yeah. right? So we we talked earlier about you know ascribing a positive or negative value system to life, right? And and the analogy given, you know, it, and the critique is. Uh, if a bully gave you a really horrible gift, so for instance, we talked about a set of china, but another one we could do is is a is a is a fresh apple pie, right? And you don't want to just throw that away and waste it. But let's assume a bully baked you a pie, but it had horrible things. It has in it, polio like, in it, like like dead crickets and snot. It's a horrible pie, and he gave you that, and he's like, "Here, you have a pie." You wouldn't really feel a responsibility to eat the snot pie because. You know, a bully gave it to you. There, there's some pre-assumption with the, 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 the gift theory. You have to value the giver. Well, no, 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 no. The, 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 the presupposition well, is you have to. It has to be a positive gift. It has to be a good thing in order for you to owe some gratitude to it. If they give you a horrible thing, like send you a bomb in the mail, you really don't owe them like yeah. a debt of gratitude for sending you a bomb. Right. And so the the idea is and, and this has even been applied to religious arguments of, well, if, if you have a um, a life that is is a really bad life. I mean, you were you were born under under a horrible regime of a dictator and an ethnicity that they really hated. Uh, you, you can imagine the uh, the Jews in, in the Holocaust. You were born a Jewish person under the Holocaust and you, you've endured a life of torture. And let's say that the the. the the Nazi Empire didn't fall. They just continued to torture you your whole life. Like, do you really owe a debt to that life of torture to say, nope, I have to endure this torture? It was it was my life that was given me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the example I would I, I would give here, you, you, you came up with the, the, the Jews there. I would go come up with the idea of, uh, you know, the zealots in, mm -hmm. in, in, in ancient Israel that, that, that gave their life rather than, you know, uh, suffer under the hands of a, a, a of a bad gift yeah, of Rome, exactly. right? You know, uh, and and that was a case where, where even though uh, religiously they weren't allowed to, allowed to commit suicide, they were allowed to give their life for for, for this. Yeah, which to me is it's, there's a there, there there's a pretty fine line there. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. At a certain point. You know, if you lock yourself up on top of a hill and you're surrounded by, by your enemies, are you committing suicide? You know? Uh, so so I, I wonder about that. Yeah, well, and, and there's an interesting time aspect that we haven't dove into really well, but d does it make some kind of difference from a suicide perspective if you have a week to live, if you have a year to live, or if you have 10 years? Because ultimately, the, 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 the question remains the same. There's amount of time X, and you will die. Mm -hmm. Now, does the length of that, and we, we hit on it a little bit in, in container theory, but does the length of that matter? And is the length of that directly proportional to the bad you're going to, yeah, I'm going to be tortured, but I can be tortured for one week and that's one portion of bad, or I can be equally tortured for a year and I got the same portion of bad over that amount of time per time unit. You know, that, That's interesting to me because I, I would say as society, we have said that it is, that there's a difference there because, uh, you know. As a society, now, in, not individually, but as, as a society, uh, that we we are hurt much much worse when a a young man kills himself than when someone on life support ha uh, pulls the uh, yeah. uh, you know pulls the cord or whatever. Yeah, there's there, there's something different there. Well, and here's I I think I know at least part of the reason that we have ascribed one of the, or ascribed one of those to be a negative and one to at the very least be a neutral, if not a, a positive. And it's control over, yes. Yeah, um, and I think it's control over your own life. I think it is perceived that the young person in a state of distress does not have control over their own life. And that's the route that they've chosen. Whereas a person advanced in years with a terminal illness, um, or whose whose body has deteriorated to, deteriorated to a certain degree, and has chosen to take their own life does have. The, in theory, if you can say that a person can rationally make the decision to commit suicide, um, has taken control of their own life. So you're talking about like a self ownership principle that changes yeah. with age. Well, changes with because condition. Um, because I think if you are subject to maybe a mental illness that makes it harder for you to think rationally. Um, I think it can be easily argued that you are not in control of your life at that point, and you're not making a decision to take control of your life. Uh, you're making an irrational decision. Whereas, the government would argue that. Whereas later on in life, um, maybe you... And, and I'm not saying that there isn't a, a point earlier in your life where you could make that rational decision. Just this is an example that's used frequently. Yeah. So not so much age, but control. You, you, you've, you've hit on a, a really interesting piece of this, and that, that's rationality, and that's actually yeah. where I want to go next. Um, could you rationally make this 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 um, decision? And and it's been argued by some that you can't. Here's the, here's how the, the argument more or less goes. It says anyone who is at the point of committing suicide is so incredibly stressed that they cannot possibly want to trust their own judgment. And if, if, if they're at that point where they can't trust their own judgment, then a judgment to commit suicide can never be valid because it can only be made under a stress situation where your, your judgment's in question. So uh, if, if you're going to make that judgment, you have to, you have to raise serious questions about your, your ability to make that judgment. What are your thoughts there? Can you can you know uh, initially? Do you think there's there can be a rational state to this? I, 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 go over that with, with me one more time. I'm sorry. Yeah. So so what it says is if you are in a place where you're logically deciding to commit suicide, okay, it has to you have to be in such a state of negative that your your mind is stressed. You're under a great deal of stress, and being under a great deal of stress, we know that affects your rationality. Sure. Sure. So you can't be under that level of stress and be rational. So any time you were at the place where you logically want to commit suicide, you're irrational. Yeah. So you can't trust your own decision. That's a very uh, legalistic argument mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, against, uh, against suicide. And I think the, that's the argument that, that governments use whenever they, they make suicide illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if you are at the point where you are willing to commit suicide, you must be so stressed that you can't make uh, you can't make rational choices. Uh, mm -hmm. at, you're at a point where your family could have taken you to court and had your rights taken away from you. So that's something that's that's um, that, that's interesting to me at the very least. Yeah. Um, I, I I wonder about the logic behind that 
because it presupposes that, uh, that, 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 that you can't make a logical choice at that point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, and, and, and we don't know that for a fact. We don't know yeah. that you can't make a logical choice whenever you're under a lot of stress. You know, uh, we've all been under a lot of stress in our lives, and I think we've we've made choices that that were logical, uh, made some that weren't logical. Mm -hmm. I've made some that are real logical whenever I was in my right mind. So, I, I wonder about the the truth of the statement, mm -hmm. but I think it's something that uh, that, that we've accepted as, as a society. Yeah, if we look at stress neutrally, I think that we can acknowledge that a person can exhibit the physical um, and neurological indications of being stressed by both negative and positive stimuli. Yeah, yeah. You, you can be overly gleeful. I mean, people get take drugs and go out and spend yeah. a lot of money and we can... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and what this seems to focus primarily on is being in a negatively stressed state. Mm -hmm. And what I would wonder is if the consideration <clears throat> has been given to being in a positively stressed state, I think most people would argue that you, except for maybe under the influence of drugs or something like that, in a positively stressed mm -hmm. state could still make a rational decision. And if they're going to make it on the positive side that you could make rational decisions, why then is it on the negatively stressed side that you could not make rational decisions. Um, and I think what it is, is that people, uh, people, and we <laughs> seem to be using this word a lot in this show, presuppose that a person who is positively stressed will not consider suicide and will not make that decision. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think that, that that presupposition goes too far, though it, it, it acts as a general guideline. Generally, mm -hmm. people don't. But... Um, uh, the the philosophical answer to this that that's come up is the the is logical gambles right we take gambles every day in our everyday life and it is showing and, that it was good yeah uh, it's gone now it's behind the, the oh. paywall well, it's yeah. not gone you just have to pay for it now yeah, yeah. you just have to pay yeah. for it um, but when we talk about logical gambles we can actually set up a scenario and and actually kind of throw that that uh, uncertainty of stress kind of back in, 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 in the, the proponent's face. We can say, okay, yeah, you can be... So let's imagine a situation where somebody has been in a fire and they're, they're incredibly badly burned, right? And they're going to die. And they need some kind of very expensive skin graft, something that's got a lot of cost, both physically, mentally, and monetarily, right? So where they're having to consider these options. And the, the other option is, is euthanasia. And there's questions of quality of life. And it's a very stressful situation for them. You can certainly argue that, well, if you commit suicide, that, that's, that's under too much stress and you really weren't thinking clearly about all your options. But can't you make the, the inverse argument? Can't you say if, if that person then decides to take the surgery and live on, like, but he was under the same amount of stress when he made that decision. So how was he really qualified to take the surgery? Therefore, we can't trust the judgment to take the surgery. So a, a, a coin flip in this case of, of the death or the surgery would, would be as, as good of an uh, indicator for whether or not he's, you know, we can't trust anything he says. So we yeah, really yeah. have to, to ask questions about what he's, what he's doing here. Yeah. yeah who, who makes the choices in this case? Obviously you're not in your right mind. Uh, yeah. One of the reasons why they oftentimes take the, the rights to make those choices away from you in those situations. Yeah. yeah. Give it to someone else. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and we can even consider the situation where, um, you, you, you don't have the choice, right? Uh, 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 a nuclear bomb's gone off, you're, you're badly injured, you're alone, and you, you, were, you were a soldier, so you have a gun by your side. You can, you can the chance of someone finding you are low, and, and you, 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 wanna, you can either wait, or you can just go ahead, and you don't want to die from, from radiation burns, and all the things that may come with a nuclear device. So you have to make this choice. And, and again, we have to say, well, any choice he made, whether he chose not to commit suicide with his lone bullet, or whether he chose to, to wait it out, or what, you know, whatever he did, we, that's not really a valid choice, because he was way too stressed to make a choice. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, and I, I think that... It, it generalizes too much because mm -hmm. um, an individual person can retain the ability to make rational decisions under much different circumstances than the next individual. Um, somebody may have a wider stress level that they can tolerate mm -hmm. in which they can make rational decisions. Uh, someone may 
only be capable of making rational decisions in a neutral to negative state. And when they're happy, they just kind of are impulsive and go with, you know, go with whatever and make terrible uh, judgment calls, uh, any number of different things. And, and I, I think for my own evaluation here, I have to say, I don't think that you can consider someone's level of stress um, and link it to their ability to make rational decisions. Well, and, and you brought up some really interest I hadn't thought before. When you talk about positive stresses and, and gleeful highs, um, you, you actually end up with a situation where you can have a very similar outcome mm -hmm. with very different motives. So yep. let's look at the YOLO movement, right? You only live once. And, and we have people screaming YOLO and climbing to the top of, of uh, what's that bridge in San Francisco or skyscrapers or whatever. Golden Gate Bridge. And and you could easily slip and fall, but you were chasing that high and it was, mm -hmm. now you still died. The, 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 the end result was the same. It live fast, die young theory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you weren't trying to die. You were trying to live fast but yeah. but uh, again we have positive stresses and 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 you know we have to to consider that as well and well and if if you reach a point in your life where you cannot conceive of ever experiencing something equal to or better than what you are experiencing at that moment it could seem logical at the time that if everything else in your life will be worse than that. Even if it's good. Even if it's good, why continue? Well, yeah, and, and we've had philosophers who have kind of played with this idea. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, hedonism, mm -hmm. but let's look at the opposite side of that. We had Diogenes, who, yeah. who often tortured himself in small ways yeah. just to say, you know, why should I even get that high? I'll just, I'll stay down here and roll around in hot sand and walk barefoot and, and all this because... Live in a barrel. Exactly. I'll live in a barrel because I'm fine with living in a barrel and, and why would I want to risk that, that, yeah. that yeah. you know, fineness I have with that? And, and, you know, I think if most people saw Diogenes today, they would say he was crazy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they would mark I think they, I think they did too. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're exactly, but th they'd mark him a mad man, probably with the, with the same vigor that they they mark the madness of somebody who was in a perfectly fine situation. Maybe the they didn't have any great prospects for life, but and, they'd be watching TV the rest of their life. They mark both both those mad. And with the great irony, they probably would have said, "You were too dangerous to be on society, but we're not going to let you remove yourself from it. We're going to lock you up and protect you." Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are through kind of all the logic pieces. I know we've been hitting them fast. Um, like I said, this is a one hour podcast and we, yeah, there's a yeah. lot here. Do we want to talk about the beer? I think and then we, we did. Yeah, we can we come did, back. I've, I've, I've poured my whole can in here now. This is what I have left. So I yeah, absolutely. To, uh, we got to get this. You want me to go first on this one? Yeah. Have at it. All right. This is, uh, the Wexford and I took my glasses off. Wexford ale. Uh, Wexford ale and it's an Irish style ale, mm -hmm. uh, brewed in, in, uh, Suffolk, England. And, uh, after I butchered the last episode that we did, I'm going to have to say that I, I'm kind of a fan of this one. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking over there across the table, and I'm wondering what, how y'all are going to respond to this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is, it's a little thin still. It's not, a, it's not a thick beer, but it's got a, it's got a full flavor. Uh, it doesn't have that sweetness and that, that I don't particularly like in a beer. It's got a, there's a little bit of bitterness on the backside, but it's not a hoppy bitterness. Um, I, I would say that this is that this is a high quality beer. I particularly like the uh, you know the head on this was had had a good flavor to it, a creaminess to it, um, and uh, I, I I would drink this beer uh, I would drink this beer all day every day. I will say it's kind of heavy uh, as far as uh, as 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 having it's a intense. bunch of these. It's intense. I think a, a couple of these beers would be would, would probably settle me, but yeah. uh, I'm going to give it a a pretty high rating. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go with a three one on this one. Okay. All right. Go ahead, John. Uh, I, from your description, um, and then you know, from your rating, I did. I didn't enjoy it as much as you did. Uh, it, it very much harkens back to me on a nitro, and I've made my many critiques yeah, of nitros. Yeah. You can go back and listen to previous shows, uh, but I feel like this is not a super flavorful bill, beer, and then that nitro uh, 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 kind of saps some some of that. That said, um, it does have a flavor. It's a subtle one. Yeah, yeah. It has a transition, and you can taste the cream. and And I honestly, at this point, don't know if I'm tasting the air bubbles of the foam, or if I'm tasting some flavor in the beard. And that's part of my, you know, issue with nitros is is it almost it it, it takes away from the flavor. 
That said, it's not a terrible beer either. It's not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, to, to sit here and say I never want this again. If somebody handed this to me, I'd be like, oh, Wexford. Now, I'd probably say I hadn't had this in a while because I'm not going to buy it either. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, a good beer, but barely a good beer. I'm going to give this a 2.7. Okay. 2.7. All right. Um, <coughs> I like this. I didn't like the head so much. I thought it was uh, dusty. Almost. Yeah, I, I I I was waiting for that because I, I think of uh, the head on like a Guinness that I always say tastes like an ashtray. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but to me, this didn't have that. This was this was a much smoother. See, I think so. I tried the head more than once, um, and with just a little bit, you get a nice creaminess. And and I'm talking trying it by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got a a good bit of it by itself, it definitely had kind of a dusty. Yeah, uh, fire uh, a chimney t taste to it. I've never licked a chimney, but of what I would imagine it tastes like. But the beer itself, I think, has a good flavor. Um, it it's bitter, but, but it's not, a not hoppy ho bitter. Yeah, it, it's hops have more of a green bitterness to a it. Bite. Yeah. Um, whereas this is is more of a smoky bitterness. I think. Um, I, I do, I have enjoyed it. I'm glad you said that smoky. That's the word I was looking mm -hmm. for that I, that I like in it. I do too. I do. Um, but I do kind of lean with John on, I'm not going to go out of my way to get this. Um, if I am not going to our normal beer place and, and I, I will never find this on the shelf of just some random gas station that carries a few craft beers but if i did and this was the one out of you know five in a selection of craft beers i might get it again i would not turn my nose up at it if somebody ever gave it to me but it's not gonna be my go-to irish beer um with that i was actually swinging between a two eight and a two nine and i think i'm gonna go with a two nine on this one because it is a good beer it's just not quite what I wanted or what I expected from an Irish style cream ale. You know, uh, two, seven, two, nine, and three, one is that mm -hmm. what it came out to? That's, that, that, that's, that's all ballpark area. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, it's a little wider, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it wasn't as wide as the last one. It wasn't year. as no. wide as the last one where I was the, uh, the, 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 the torpedo the torpedo out there. But, uh, and go figure, this is the one on the high one. So go, yeah, I, I yeah right. Know. We all have our own tastes. Yeah. So, uh, but, but a good beer. Important questions. Lawnmower. Uh, not a lawnmower beer. Uh, I, I, to me, this is more of a winter beer. I, it's something that, that I want to have on the front porch when it's a little cool outside. Mm -hmm. So. Yep, and it says to serve cool, so that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as your date beer, um, I'm gonna say pre-date. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you're in the in in the uh, bar, the smoky atmosphere, you're trying to find a girl. It's not a bad one to try. Uh, maybe something that uh, that kind of. Is rem more reminiscent of the the place you tend to go to yeah. to, to find people. So so let's try it there. Is yeah. this going to get you laid? Um, I really think this one kind of comes out six one way, half a dozen the other. Uh, I don't think it's going to seal the deal for you though. Okay, okay. It would with me. It's not going to be a negative in my mind. All right, but it's it's not going to seal you, the deal. If you want to sleep with me, this will work. Okay, I'm just so throwing money. it out there. So uh, so will money or you know. I I got these. You so could, or you Tuesday. Could, you could just ask. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean. So uh, back to it. Back to it, and we are into morality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for for the first half of this podcast, we really uh, uh, focused internally. We looked at your situation, yeah. how you felt. But uh, when we start to move into, and we ask, can it be logical, right? Uh, but when we start to look at moral stuff, uh, I think. <clears throat> <coughs> morality necessitates a, a, an outward view on the world and, and the first thing that that you know we we come to when we talk about this is your friends and family right the the people that you're closest with that you have relationships with and how there's an outward let's say ripple effect across them yeah. of how they're going to feel now i still think we can look at this from a utilitarian aspect and say okay well now let's let's expand our equation and see how it makes other people feel. Um, but, but some would argue in this friends and family's case that 
no matter how bad that you might be feeling, that it would be so hurtful to those, to so many people around you. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, you could say maybe you live alone in the mountains and then you have a different situation well, but for the the average person it's going to hurt a lot of people and and so this kind of kind of is a reason why you should never commit suicide okay well I, but in the utilitarian argument you have to see what your utility would be mm -hmm. so if you looked at it and said uh you know my utility to my family is that i'm a provider for them i'm a i'm a source of strength for them i'm, I'm a moral and all of a sudden I'm a vegetable, I'm laying in bed, I can't provide. Your utility is not there anymore, and at that point, with a ut pure utilitarian argument, you, you would be justified in this. Yeah. So, you, you know, it depends on, on, on how you're looking at this. Yeah. Um, well, and, and what I hear argued on the moral side so often is it's going to hurt your friends and family. They're going to miss you when you're gone. Um, and... I think a lot of times you're hearing these uh, these statements from somebody who hasn't been there um, because there are thoughts that go through your head of, yeah, it might hurt them. They might be sad, but their life will be better off without me. Mm -hmm. um, if If I'm no longer here, I can't do additional things to hurt them. I'll do this one thing and it will hurt them and it may hurt them for a long time, but I can't continue to pile on over and over for the, throughout the years. Yeah. You're, you're, it's the scales where you, you know, the, 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 the one evil is not as bad as the 10 evils. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and one philosophical critique of the, the fa friends and family argument of, of how much hurts you're going to cause them it is very similar to the 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 bully's gift mm -hmm. argument and that says if you are truly in this state of horrible suffering maybe it's mental maybe it's physical whatever that is um wouldn't your friends and family want you to not be right. in a horrible state wouldn't they no. when, when they kind of wouldn't it be immoral for them to wish you to continue to be in this state and yeah and not permit you to be to get the relief yeah so if if they want you to be there you have to ask are they really your friends are they someone that cares about you or are they acting selfishly and and if if they don't want you to be there then then it kind of nullifies the argument in a true logical sense i, I think we need to throw you know yeah. Ill illogical and mental health out the window and right. say in a logical sense uh, what, what do you think about this uh, 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 selfish friends and family kind of critique of this? I think it's a powerful critique. I think it's uh, uh, something there that's uh, – uh, I, I think it's one of the best arguments against mm -hmm. it. The fact that uh, – uh, here, here's the point that, that, that always strikes me with this is – it necessitates that your value – this whole argument says that your value is based on your effect on others. You mm -hmm. don't have an inherent value in yourself. Right. Your value is all based on how you affect other people Because in this argument. That, that, that's, that's the way it goes. And I wonder about the logic behind that. Mm -hmm. Don't I have a value of my own or does it, is my value just – how do I affect others? Well, right. then where did they get value to give you value? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, if, if nobody has value, then it's all in value. Yeah, yeah right? it's very sociocentric. Yeah. It, 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 it suggests that I don't own my own life, mm -hmm. that my yeah. life is owned by society and how I, you know, how my life affects society is what's important. Yeah. Well, and, and I absolutely hate this argument of um, people who commit suicide are selfish. Because I think that argument can be flipped on its head um, in the perspective that you were describing of if I am in so much anguish that I, I view that this is the only way out, I think um, it can be flipped to it's selfish of them to wish you to continue in that. Yeah. I think there is a lot of selfishness on, on all sides. And the problem that we run into is – people have to determine which has more value. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's... I, I, think, I think the argument that it's selfish is an accurate argument. I just don't necessarily think that... They're saying... That, that that's a bad thing. Yeah, <laughs> well, and yeah. what it seems like they're saying is that the selfishness of the person who committed suicide is 
less valuable than their own selfishness to have that person still here. Yeah, I, I think the the argument is right that it's selfish, you know, to think about yourself in that way. Yeah. But I think making the inverse argument is own but selfishness. But they're blind to their own selfishness. So I think making the, the inverse argument is own selfishness. Because if, if you have the pause to, to look at someone who died and say, but why weren't they thinking about me? Yeah. Well, except, except you know, we're back to the scales. Okay? Yeah. yeah. The scales of you're going to kill yourself because it will make you feel better, mm -hmm. but you're going to hurt the lives of 15 other people on the on the great scales. What is more selfish to to, to protect yourself or to hurt 15? And how people? much are you going to hurt them? And, and yeah. how much are you hurting? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I understand the logic. I I, I, I yeah. do, and I, I I do think it is accurate to say that that that, that to commit suicide is a selfish act, yeah. without well, a doubt. I yeah. just wonder about whether that equates to it being a bad thing. Yeah, a hard utilitarian might might make the case that if you were going to commit suicide, what you what you in fact need to do is consider all the people that it's going to hurt and then, you know, maybe ask them like, if I died, how much would that hurt you? And then total all that up and then go to yourself say, okay, it's going to hurt grandma a lot. Um uh, Joe said he'll be fine, and then take that and say, "Well, how much it's am I hurting?" It's going to hurt grandma a lot, but grandma's only going to be be hurting for a couple exactly, of years. It's going to yeah. hurt my son, and he's going to suffer with this for the next sixty years. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah and and then weigh all that out. I mean, if you were going to talk true utilitarian, now um, the deontologist and, and the next three sections are going to be deontology, but like I said, we're we're kind of skimming the surface. Acting from duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They have a very similar um, kind of. Uh, uh, um, approach to to this question and and they they talk about friends and family as well but what they they talk about it from a duty place not from balancing the scales but they say well let's say you had a child or a roommate or somebody that depended on you that you make made an agreement whether explicit or implicit to to help out in society and we can almost all come and look and say people that that rely on us even in this podcast like we agree to come in every week right so if if you know maybe that'd be a consideration one of us would have to make and they say well you have these agreements and you have a responsibility to them and when you end those your life you're breaking those so that in itself is an argument that you can't commit suicide because you're shirking your responsibility to those who rely on you bitch i didn't promise to live forever Okay, but fine. But but I think there's a difference in saying, um, I'm going to buy this car. Oh, wait, I got robbed. I have no money. And a difference in saying, I'm going to buy this car. Nah, you know what? I don't want to anymore. Yeah, I think yeah. that, that, that that's a different argument. I, I think there is an argument that you have a duty to others. I, 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 I you know, uh, I don't know that it's, that it's right, but I think there is an argument there. I think I have a duty to my family. And, uh, you know, you... you, you one of the things you need to consider is, you know, the the effect it has on on. I'm I'm going to say your children. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, killing yourself might 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 reduce your pain, but don't you have a duty not to put that pain on your family? Mm -hmm. Well, and and I think we send grossly mixed mixed signals in society. We tell people things like, "You are the source of your own self worth." You don't need to worry about what other people think until your own self-worth deteriorates to the point you value your yourself to the point that you don't view it as advantageous to continue your life. At that point is where all of a sudden it matters what everybody else in the world thinks of you. In fact, is more important than what you think of yourself. I, I think we set people up to be distraught from these conundrums and end up committing suicide because we are sending such mixed signals. I don't know. I think uh, I, I see where you're coming from, but I think they're two, two different, two things that are so vastly different. Um, and I, I, I could be wrong here. I, okay. I just, I, I'm not seeing the connection there. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and, and one of the, the uh, philosophical critiques of the, the responsibility uh, to those who rely on you is uh, don't you have uh, similarly a responsibility to yourself? Yeah, yeah. And, and this is a much weaker critique um, to make because um, 
you have kind of a scale here of of responsibility to many people, and and now you're you're saying by fulfilling one critique, I violate another. So now you you kind of find yourself back in a utilitarian paradox where you 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 haven't really come up with a a way of of deontologically evaluating this. Yeah. You've just kind of found a scale in which your responsibility to everyone else is way outweighs your responsibility to yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, th th this whole concept of the scale, while I think it's a great uh, uh, tool for, for studying and understanding, I can't really imagine anybody taking a, and, and making a list and, you know, that does one side outweigh the other, which is, you know, it's just a tool. Yeah. Uh, I may, may, maybe we should do that, but uh, I don't. I can't see anybody actually doing that. Yeah, one of the one of the the deontological uh, reasons that people that deontologists say you can't commit suicide is is you may have a deontological um, banishment or ban on harm, and we can talk with with deontology about the the case of of the five people in the hospital who all need an organ and the one guy can we kill him yeah. to give them organs save five yeah. lives for one. You have a duty to do no harm. Yeah, yeah. and so so a response to that, well, we can't harm him, right? And um, so one argument that might be made on on why you can't do that is you have a duty not to harm, and if you if you kill yourself, you're harming yourself. Um, so does that seem like a compelling argument for why you you couldn't ever commit suicide? Well, I, here's here's my situation: is I think it makes a philosophical leap. And that's that I think that you have a deontological argument not to harm others. But I don't think you have a duty not to harm yourself because – and, and, and here, here, here's my logical reasoning behind it is if you reach the point where you believe killing yourself is less damaging than living, you're not – you're no longer harming yourself. Yeah. You're, 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 there's a net benefit. Yeah, yeah. and and that's actually uh, uh, more or less the the critique of the the harm argument, and and it, it's called harm overall, right? Mm -hmm. So the argument is, well, yes, you're right. You're you're, you're doing a harm, um, but it's not an overall harm. And and the example that's given for this is somebody who has an infection in their leg. And the infection is going to grow and kill them. And you go to a doctor's office and the doctor amputates your leg because, um, you know, you, you don't want to die. And then we have to ask a philosophical question. Well, did the doctor harm you? You had a leg. You cut it off. Isn't that, a, a thing of, isn't that a, an act of harm? And, and the response is, yes, it was an act of harm. But overall, she was better after it was done. So it wasn't harm overall. You have to say it was a little harm for a lot yeah, of benefit. In the scales of justice, it was not harmful. Yeah, exactly. And and so that, that's kind of the critique of of harm overall. Does does this create harm overall in, in any given action? Because actions are, are complicated things. The the last deontological um, uh, scale we want to look at or, 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 or dimension we want to look at is consent, right? Um, a lot of people uh, who subscribe to deontology talk about consent and how consent uh, uh, makes things okay. The reason you can't kill the guy uh, to save the five lives isn't because it's going to do harm, because it won't do harm overall. Overall, it'll be less harm. It's because he didn't consent to that act. Um, and, and so they say that the, the, the reason that suicide is okay is because it's a consensual act. Do you think consent makes suicide okay? Well, I, I, I think I think there's a logical argument there that, that can, can you give yourself consent to do something? Can uh, you not consent to something you do you to yourself? Can you not consent mm -hmm. to something that you're doing to yourself? Yeah. Uh, Alien hand syndrome? Yeah. Okay. I, you know. I, 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 I think logically, yes, consent would make it okay. Uh, that having been said, I don't, I don't understand how, you, how you're not consenting and doing it. One, one, argue, one critique that's been made of, of consensual suicide is, is reason, Right. So, so they make the argument of somebody comes up to you who's clearly mentally handicapped and says, I want you to kill me. Or a three-year-old is, is joking around and says, ha ha, why don't you kill me? I don't, there would be very few who argued in that case that, well, if you killed that three-year-old, then, then suddenly your act has, has a moral component to it. You're okay in killing that three-year-old because you had his consent. So we, we start to get into to very deep questions about when is consent justified and, and does consent really make everything okay? And, and, and what I, I've heard a lot of, of people talking about 
uh, in in that philosoph philosophical nature that, that I really love is reason. Are the actions reasonable? And, and they measure it a few different ways. One, can you explain why you're consenting to this? Can can you lay out a logical argument on why you want to die? And if you can, then then you have a, a segment of reason to you too. Are your actions generally logical? Maybe you could you could explain to me that the reason you want to kill yourself is because every night aliens come down, abduct you, and then do horrible experiments on you. And then you say, well, yeah, that's a reason, but it's not logical. You don't have yeah. logical fallacies about you. And, and then um, very similar to that logical fallacies about you is – Experience and intelligence. That's where you start to get into the three-year-old situation. Yeah, he's he's got some logic to him, but he he, he very much lacks a long-term view on on life that is needed in order to make such deep and uh, decisions. Which is kind of where we get into our age of consent thing uh, in society. Okay. All all that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. No, no. yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was kind of my, my everything I had on the morality of suicide. Uh, the very last thing I want to get into, and this one's fascinating to me, is religion. Because multiple religions have an afterlife component. Um, and and those afterlife components actually kind of nullify many of the arguments that we've made before. The the two-state condition, the the um, uh, will things be, be better, um, uh, the uncertainty, all of this. Does the idea... Believing in it, whether it's true or not, of an afterlife, affect the whole scales we've been talking about this whole time on suicide. It would seem to me that it, you're no longer talking about death, but a change of state. Yeah. I don't want to live on Earth anymore. I want to live in Valhalla. Right? Yeah. Well, I, 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 think that, um, I, I think that's part of the reason why most of these systems, I think of uh, you know, the Roman Catholic faith until... Until the, until Pope John Paul would not bury you uh, in a Catholic burial if you committed suicide. Yeah. Eastern Orthodox still won't. Greek Orthodox still won't. Russian Orthodox still won't. I don't think the Jews will will, will if you commit suicide. Um, so, yeah, or if you commit suicide, you go to hell. You yeah, know. well, yeah, yeah. But I think that that is what prevents suicide from, from being more prevalent in that system. Because honestly, if, if you're a believer, and, and I'm a Christian, and you believe that... Uh, there is something better out there. Why wouldn't you want yeah. to rush that? Right. right. Why wouldn't you want to rush that? Because there's a rule that says that if you do, yeah. you don't get to go there. Yeah, and uh, you get I, to go to the guaranteed worst place. Well, except, except I think there's a there's a reason behind that too, and I think that reason goes back to this idea of of this gift that, that we talked about earlier, that, that God gave you this gift of life, and it is your duty to protect that gift. Well, then you have to go to if. God gave you this gift and predetermined you had things to do on this earth, then when you attempted to commit suicide, it wouldn't work. Well, except you're, then you're arguing, you're arguing that, that God is, everything is predetermined, and that's by no means all Christians. In fact, okay, it's not fact, all Christians. You're fact, right. the majority of Christian, Christian faiths do not believe in predestination. Yeah, one, one thing that I kind of skipped over in the gift of life argument is, is the, the similar argument that if you're, if you're, kill yourself you're going against god's will the the predetermined whatever that means and uh, real quickly without getting too deep into it the, the philosophical critique of that is well if you save someone's life then where are you going against god's will i mean he wanted yeah. him to die and and now you have to say well why did you save me i was supposed to die back there yeah. you know well, again that, that that goes back to the idea of of you know of free will and all did god yeah. did god want him to die or did god put everything there and and, and you made the right choice in saving him uh, well, we can get into well. Yeah. Let's yeah. not get yeah. into the free will but, thing because that's a long. Then time. you have to get into the same thing with suicide. You do, right? you do, yeah. and, and and that that's the issue that you run into with this stuff. Um, so you know you, you, you got to kind of kind of wonder about that mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But I think it's necessary that if you are going to create a heaven or a Valhalla or anything like that, that for to keep society from completely collapsing, you have to have this this idea of. Uh, of, of you can't kill yourself yeah. or, or you're going to have problems. The badness of the suicide. Look, look, yeah. look, look yeah. at systems that don't. Uh, look at systems that don't where uh, in, in some branches of, of Islam where uh, where if you if, if you die uh, c committing holy war that, that you get rewarded. Look at, mm -hmm. uh, at Shintoism in, mm -hmm. in Japan where if you died for the, the glory of the emperor that you were rewarded with a, mm -hmm. with a, with a better afterlife. 
There's a difference there. Mm-hmm. Uh, even early Christianity, when the Crusades, where they said if you died in the Crusades, you're going to things will be better for you. Yeah. Uh, you have to have that rule if you're going to have that that system. Well, your system dies out. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. everybody's offing themselves yeah, yeah. because they're trying to get to the super awesome place, your religion ceases to be. And like a living organism, a religion's primary objective is self-continuance. Well, yeah. we, we saw this with Haley's Comet. A bunch of guys went out in Nike sneakers naked and drunk, dr- drank cyanide, and that religion doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. That Was that Haley's Comet? I, I thought it was. was. Comet. I, I remember it was it a Comet. Don't matter. I don't remember, but it was a Comet. I don't yeah. think it was Haley's Comet. Yeah, but yeah. you don't see yeah. that religion much anymore, no, no. right? It's gone. It's gone. Yeah, uh, it went with Haley's Comet. The you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we've had a few of those over the years, suicide mm-hmm. cults that have, that have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that branch Davidians, mm-hmm. uh, you know, th- th- this kind of thing happens. Uh, but, I, but I think if religion brings a different aspect to it, and, and you've got to wonder about that kind of st- thing. Uh, what happens if if your religion says, you know, that, 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 that you, can't, you can't go to heaven? Are you, are you then, uh, you know, are, are you then committing a crime? How about those ones that say that that there are there are sects of Christianity that believe that sin is passed from father to son, mm-hmm. and that if you do this, your child to the third generation will be uh, will, will, yeah. will be damned for your sin. You know, you you've got to wonder about this stuff. Yeah. Well, I I wonder if um, religion has prevented a lot of suicides with that that barrier, either of your children are going to go to hell too, not just you. Um, or even just the barrier of, you know what, you have done the necessary things to guarantee that you're going to go into heaven, but if you do this one thing, you're you're definitely not going no matter what. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and, and I don't I don't know I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Uh, and it, because I don't think you can measure it. Uh, no, you absolutely you know, it's can't. Something that can't be absolutely measured. Absolutely can't. It's like measuring mental health. You know, yeah. you, you you look at uh, at suicide, and one of the things that always bothered me is that that suicide. Seems to be um, seems to run in families. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it, is that because that this family is culturally uh, accepting of it, or is it because mental illness runs in families? Yeah. You know, I think of all the Hemingways that have killed themselves. Mm-hmm. There, there, there have been tons of them. Uh, you know, and, and you know, if if, if you, you commit suicide, the odds of your children committing suicide are great, is great, are, are greatly increased. Well, and, and there's an interesting uh, uh, argument to be made where, at a certain point in life, suicide in mass actually becomes a, a societal like benefit. And we, we we've talked about different things where where um, the death squads. We frame it in very negative ways, but if if and and we talked about. Off the show, we were hanging out at the pool. Oh, you're talking about a sci-fi book where everybody gets to live 25 years yeah, yeah. and then they Logan's die. run, yeah. Yeah, but, but the, there becomes almost an evolutionary component where you could see some kind of pressure of, okay, live your 50 years, breed, and then kill yourself so resources can be reallocated amongst yeah. the, the rest of society. Yeah. Uh, but that, that, that really kind of only works in mass because if, if certain groups don't do it, the they're, I don't think that's I don't I, I don't think that's suicide at that point because it's you know it's it's the, the states involved or or cultures involved there's something else involved there it's uh, I don't know what you would call it but I don't think I would call it suicide at that point it's condoned suicide uh, condoned and even encouraged yeah uh, I don't know to, that suicide to to me is is is. It can't be suicide if it involves more than one. It just, it, 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 you know, that, that's a, that, that's something that a person does to themselves. Hmm. And if there's an outside action, it's 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 no longer suicide. If I if I spend my whole life convincing you to go kill yourself, and then you go kill yourself, you know, am I partially responsible? And if I am, is it suicide? Well, you know, I, I, I wonder about that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that one would be. Yeah. Um, I want to get in. Uh, are, are, are we through with this? We, section? We've gone through kind of my list of of you know the 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 different philosophical arguments. Yeah. We can kind of freelance it for I, now. I, I, I do kind of want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, you, you know, at at what point, at what point should society or, or can society accept suicide? Uh, and at what point is can, can you have doctor assisted suicide? You know. We have uh, Dr. Kevorkian, Dr. Kevorkian, uh, the doctor of death. He's dead now, but he, he, uh, 
you know, he, he went around helping people uh, doing assisted suicides for, for years. Uh, and I got to be honest, there's a point in my life whenever I'm uh, uh, hooked up to machines where I'm going to want somebody to help me do that. I'm not going to want to be, uh, be, be on a machine. Yeah. Is, is that okay? Is it okay to, at that point? Is, is you know, I don't know. I, I want to, I think that's interesting. And, and I don't want to take us too far from your question. I, I think you, you've raised an important question here. But I, I think that this this is a great example of something we, we, we talked we've talked about in previous shows uh, with political averages and, and voting systems and how this all turns out because I think there's two really strong views in this case, right? There's a view that nobody should kill themselves. That shouldn't be a thing that society accepts, right? And then there's this view that People who kill themselves shouldn't have to do it in horrible fashions. It should be doctor assisted and as painless as possible, right? And and whenever we see two extreme views like this that are polarized, where nobody likes what's in the middle, nobody likes you should only have to you can commit suicide, but only if it's horrible. Nobody likes you you know you should only be able to kill yourself alone. Like no yeah, yeah. nobody's there for that. Uh, we we tend to see this weird thing where politicians will ride that line just where it's just barely acceptable to both sides, and you get this thing that nobody likes. And, and I think we have seen a really interesting societal shift toward uh, being more accepting of, of, of compassionate doctor. Compassionate suicide is compassionate, what it's being called now. Yeah, compassionate suicide. In fact, I've heard uh, really strong arguments that the Dr. Kevorkian is the reason we don't have it. If he would have just uh, gotten a lawyer instead of trying to represent himself, we'd have it today. But he did so poor in his own case that he set the whole thing back. But anyway, so, so to your question... When is that permissible? Is that is that the, the, yeah, the yeah. question you want to get to? Um, I, to me, you know, and after looking into some of this stuff, I think it's permissible uh, when it has the the air of rational consent. And I almost, you know, think of there are some cases where I think this should be waived for obvious reasons. I almost think of the idea of a suicide waiting list, right? You want to go apply to commit suicide. Okay, fine. You need to talk to a therapist and you need to d establish rationality of this. Uh, or at least rationality of your facilities. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean logic. That means rationality. That means that... You're capable of making a choice. Yes, and, and you're capable of explaining the process of making that choice. Now, you may you may believe the world is flat. That That's really irrelevant to the question. The question is... Are you rational? Did you reach it in a rational manner? Yeah. yeah, and then you know if you say and you gotta you gotta wait a month, right? Because uh, now we could we could imagine the the case of the the terminally ill cancer patient has a week to live. The, a one month waiting period didn't really make sense. But for for yeah. cases other than that, I think I think the point of well, if it's rational now, it'll be rational in a month. Or if it's not rational in a month and you have years to live, we really have to ask the value assessment of this. So is is the goal with that system to um, to I don't, I don't necessarily want to say condone suicide. I think it's to um, prevent a knee jerk reaction. Yeah, is it to kind of keep people from going through one bad situation, letting them know that there are resources out there, keep them th from going through one bad situation and just pulling the trigger? Um, which I don't think will fix everything. Um, and we've had similar conversations with regard to uh, drug, the drug problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it would solve everything. I think the overhead, overhead would be a nightmare. Um, but I think it's a better solution than a lot that I've heard. Well, I, I think it does a couple things for us. I think the uh, first thing it does is it, is it does make sure that that you know there is there is a consent and rationality you're not being pressured to do this or mm -hmm. whatever the case is second thing well and you uh, can be directed if you are being pressured if there is a situation that can be remedied that will mm -hmm. fix the situation once you you get there you can be directed to people who can help second thing i i think it does is gives a back door out so for instance if i'm contemplating suicide and suicide's illegal today, and it's going to be illegal in a month. <coughs> then there, there's no real reason to wait. Like, yeah. why not do it now? There, there, there's no yeah. difference except for my suffering between now and then. So, so why not go healthy act? And the, the third thing it does is is 
takes a lot of the stigma off. So, for instance, right now, if you went and wanted to talk to somebody about suicidal thoughts you were having, one big fear that people have is being locked up and completely prevented. Yeah, and yeah. they will. And so you you don't talk to people. It's, it's very stigmatized. So yep. if you had a thing where you could say, yeah, just talk to us. You got to wait a month. You got to talk to somebody. But if you can establish <laughs> these clauses, you can just do it. Now you can talk to somebody. It's it's it's, it's very easy. It's it's as easy as going to get your your <laughs> doctor's checkup. To, to yeah, if your goal is to commit suicide. Going to talk to somebody isn't going to prevent you from achieving your goal, or it's not flatly going to prevent you from achieving your goal. It may change your goal. Yeah. Um, but you know, you do uh, still have that that possibility of getting the okay. Yeah. I'm in this really bad place because uh, I, I, if if you are at all out there considering suicide, I sincerely hope you're talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But. Philosophically, I believe I own myself, and the state doesn't have any right to tell me what I can or can't do with myself. And mm -hmm. if I want to kill myself, that's that is my right to do it. Yeah, Even, I have a right to make bad choices. Right, and uh, that that's philosophically where I come from. But intellectually, I look at it and I go, "But please don't, yeah. please don't do that." Yeah. yeah, your your right to make bad choices doesn't negate that that it was a bad choice. Yeah, it, it was yeah. still a bad choice. And, yeah. and, I, I and that, that's my issue with the waiting period, though. Is 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 where where does the state have the right to tell me I have to wait for anything? Well, he, here's here's what I think it is, and and I don't think it's it's a, like what are they going to do if you commit suicide early? Like, are they going to arrest your corpse and throw it in a jail? Yeah. But I, I think a waiting period for doctor assisted suicide. It's kind of where I'm going there. I, I might be able to see yeah. that because because the, the doctor is licensed under the state. Yeah. Right. So you've got something there. I, I, I can kind of see that. Uh, you've got other issues with doctor-assisted suicide of, you know, uh, you know, d does a doctor, you know, above all else, do no harm? Are they doing harm, you know? Well, and, and that's interesting. I actually did some research apart from the show, and maybe we need to, to do a show on on the Hippocratic Oath. Yeah, yeah, they don't actually swear it. Yeah, they don't yeah, swear yeah. it. It has no legal bearing, yeah. And and if you were going to swear it, there's a lot of really yeah. weird things you have to swear in that, there. That, that's true. That's yeah. true. But it, is, but it is still socially accepted, that, that part of it. Doctors are, are accept, I won't do harm. I'm, well, I, you know, and, and I think that, I think... I think we expect our doctors not to do harm. Well, and, and even if we were just going to accept the principle of it, for, for, forget the Hippocratic Oath, I think we can go back to, to the philosophical basis we've laid here and look at overall harm. Yeah. And I think I think we have a really good foundation in overall harm to say uh, he's made a judgment, he's gone through through logic counseling, and he believes that something in his life is so wrong that it is a bad thing to live yeah. and we, we can't find any logical issues with him. He's gone through the waiting period. At, at this point, somebody who's waited a month and still is there and has talked to people, I think the cases of them turning around and not doing it privately are low. And so then they have to ask questions about overall harm. Have I done less harm? Because the case may be, and we've seen this many times, he finally says if he can't get any help or she, screw it. I'm going to put a shotgun in my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't kill them. It disfigures them. In fact, there, there was and a... And then they're put in jail because and then somebody suicide rushes is and illegal. Them. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we've even seen cases where people were disfigured, then lived many years in a worse condition than they were beforehand, and then committed suicide yeah. any way after that, right? Here, here, here's the, the logical problem that I want to throw out at you because this is the one that, that, that kills me when it comes to the state, mm -hmm. uh, is suicide is illegal. I cannot decide <laughs> to kill myself, okay? Mm -hmm. But I can sign a DNR, a do not resuscitate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the difference between a DNR and a suicide? I mean, honestly, if you, I, I, I mean, we're talking about gradients here. Isn't DNR essentially medical assisted suicide? Yeah, you yeah. You, you you can lay on the tracks, but they can't send <coughs> the train for you. They just can't switch it to to, to yeah. divert the train. They have yeah. to let the train go through. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a, again another symptom of where I talk about society has two extremes here: no suicide versus very. Uh, uh, Would you call it? Um, uh, compassionate suicide uh, yeah. versus compassionate suicide where we have these two extremes and what they've come to in the middle is well how about if we just wait for him to die of 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 
natural causes. Is, is that kind a of painful death? Yeah. We're, yeah. Okay, we're gonna put a DNR so they die painfully. Yeah. Slowly. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna make it as bad as it can possibly be. But we'll let them die anyway. Like yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, which, which 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 bothers me. You yeah. know. I, it I, should. I look, I look at it's that. It's fucked up. It it seems barbaric to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, I, I'm, I'm really of mixed opinion on, on, on this stuff. I, I, philosophically, I believe you own yourself. I believe you have the right to do this. Uh, I, I want it to be, I want it to be painless if you're going to do it. But yeah. I look at it and I go, I don't, I, I can't say that I, that I can condone that a doctor helping. I don't know what I think about that because it's, it, it terrifies that slippery slope argument terrifies me. Yeah. Uh, you know, how far, how far are you from, uh, you know, so devaluing life that the people that are supposed to be saving, when people that are supposed to be saving life are now taking lives. Have you devalued life a lot? And, are they uh, supposed to be saving life or improving? In, well, then, improving a person's a, that's condition. A, that's an interesting well, question. I, but but, but I, I wonder about that. I think I think we generally, as a society, say that, that a doctor's purpose is to save lives. Well, and then um, we have to ask interesting questions about pulling the plug on a vegetable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So... I think uh, I think I'm beat on this one. Yeah, uh, I understand. Yeah, it's been a tough one. So, um, as we said earlier in the show, if suicide is something you are considering or even have considered, go talk to somebody. That's important. Anyone, just talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We yeah. Before we go, uh, I think it's Mike's turn, but if, if you don't mind, oh, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and take the plug this time. Uh, it, it, this isn't exactly a podcast, but I think any of our listeners will, will get a great deal of use out of it. I want to go ahead and plug youtube.com slash Yale Courses. Yeah. They have a ton of courses on everything from philosophy to uh, medical science. They have one on breast cancer. Yeah. They, they have... Uh, music, yeah. economics, you, whatever you you're interested in, I'm sure you'll find something. System. I know okay. if you've got a Roku box or uh, you can get that as one of the channels too. Oh, so really? it's all that, that's all out there available. So that's my plug this week. I'll put it at the end of this video, and we'll put a link in the description. Yeah. Go check out uh, Yale courses on YouTube. Yep. Awesome, yep. awesome. All right. So anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope that you have enjoyed this discussion we hope you've gotten something, something useful out of it, out yeah. Of it yeah um let us know what you guys think are there questions that maybe we didn't consider that we should have are there answers that we gave that you feel were maybe not fully thought out um and that's probably all of them like yeah. i said uh, yeah uh like i said don't forget if you are considering or have considered go talk to somebody take care of yourself uh cheers guys cheers cheers Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.